Hello, I'm Scott Lathrop uh, with the Blue Waters Project at uh, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. We would like to welcome you to today's Blue Waters Weekly Seminar. Uh, today, uh, it's our pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Frank Wilmore, who will be talking about getting I.O. done with parallel HDF on Blue Waters. Uh, again, we encourage you to pose questions as they arise and we'll work with Frank to get those answered uh, during the course of uh, this webinar. Uh, there's a bio for Frank on the webpage. And with that, Frank, uh, thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Frank Wilmore. I'm with the HDF group. I'm a, a PhD in chemical engineering and working with work in high performance computing the past few years. Uh, and I'm working as a developer with the HDF group. So today we're talking about getting parallel I.O. done with HDF5. So we'll go over something of something on, on Blue Waters. We'll talk about something about uh, typical problems and, and goals in trying to get better parallel I.O. We'll talk about parallel HDF5, a little bit about what's different between it and regular HDF5. And we'll have, a, have an extended discussion of uh, Sysm Core I.O. kernel, which is something we developed in uh, conjunction with uh, a user team under the paid project with uh, with Blue Waters. Uh, we'll and I'll go on to talk about some of the lessons learned and we've got a time allowing a couple of advanced topics we might touch on. So uh, there's a quote I like to start with, is it a, a supercomputer is a device for turning compute bound problems into IO bound problems. Uh, we, uh, Moore's Law is, is, is done when we and everything else is getting processors to communicate, cooperate, and really getting data to the right place at the right time. And that's, that's the challenge for the next 20 years, I think. So with that, we'll go on with uh, stating, a, stating a typical problem. So for, for our, our, our user we were working with on this project, we, they were having trouble with, uh, they like using HDF5 library, they like using the advanced features of it, and they were having trouble getting the same performance with HDF5 that they were getting with some of the other uh, parallel I.O. packages that are available. And so this is, so basically we're trying to figure out how do we get, how do we get uh, as good a performance with HDF5 as we can get with some of the other packages if, if we're not seeing it out of the box. So <clears throat> there's a, a few common causes uh, for, for I.O. problems and it's uh, you can say it's, uh, it's not my fault. The uh, it's the I/O system isn't sized right for the computing app for the app for the how we're trying to do this. Uh, it's not my fault. It's not our fault. The, the system's misconfigured. Uh, it's not our fault. It's uh, there's noise on the system. There's other applications running, and these are all possible things uh, that can be going on. Uh, but the most common thing that happens is your application is reading and writing data in a way that's not giving you the best I.O. performance. And it's not always your fault. There's just, thing, it takes time to get these things right. Like you, you, you don't always, the first time you write something, it's usually not optimal. And so this is what we talk about in some ways to get things more optimal. So <clears throat> to, to, to some things we can start with is that you, you check the first few things and just, just get a, a pretty good idea to see if, if those issues are in fact relevant. Um, and then, and then you start to work by characterizing your I.O. You start where you are. You characterize your I.O. through profiling and you put something of a performance plan where you're figuring out what you can control and what you can't. And then you, you get to know your system well enough and you, you, start making a, you start making a strategy and realize that you may not get quite what you want uh, and you be, be prepared that, to, settle for, to settle for what you're able to actually get out of your system. There's a trade-off between how much time you spend on it and diminishing returns. So, say that. Now, we're speaking specifically about parallel I/O with HDF5. Uh, so let's talk about parallel features of HDF5. Oh, parallel HDF5 is HDF5. It's running, but it's running MPI I/O under the hood. Uh, File format for parallel HDF5 is the is the same as it is for HDF5. It's you can read the same file in parallel or in serial. Uh, metadata and uh, and actual data are both handled in parallel with parallel HDF5. You can use single files. You can you, or you can use multiple files, but you know I necessarily want to use multiple files. Uh, with it, you can aggregate at the MPI level for collective operations, reads and writes and we'll, we'll talk about that. 
Uh, there's other options available for aggregating uh, reads and writes. For example, Damaris is one that's, that's a possible uh, tool that can be used for that. And we'll finally, we'll get into topics of read and write storms, which is a, with a 110 releases, uh, there's significant improvements regarding how um, reading, reading metadata and how to avoid read storms with metadata. So introducing, to introduce Parallel, we have, first have to introduce HDF5 a little bit. Uh, who's behind all this? We're the HDF group. We're actually here in Champaign-Urbana, which is why I'm here at NCSA, because it's easier just to come and, and say hello to people and, and do the seminar from here. What is HDF5? It's a data container which with a lot of built-in uh, in, in, intrinsic capability. It's not a big buzzword. It's uh, one of the best kept secrets in, in large data, actually. Uh, we're, we're working to get our, to communicate it better now uh, because it is, it is something that's useful to a lot of people where it's being used, academia, enterprise, government. We're, we're always surprised to find people using our product for things. Uh, it's, it, it's the basis for a lot of good things. A lot of people use it as, uh, for implementing a file format standard, they'll build their standard on top of HDF5. When should you consider using HDF5 and not, and when not? Yeah, it depends. Uh, it's not the best format for everything, uh, but it's useful for a lot of things. If you're, if you're thinking about it, get in touch with us. Uh, we're happy to help people figure out what's, what, what works for them and, and such. And why, do, why, does, uh, why, do, why does my neighbor make jokes about HDF5? There's, uh, the, the biggest complaint I would say about HDF5 is there's too many features, and it can be intimidating to use sometimes to figure out how to do the most basic things. Uh, but we're, we're getting more information out about some of that, and actually some of the packages like the like uh, H5Py, Python interface is extremely elegant and easy to use if you're, uh, but not necessarily for doing parallel I/O, but for using HDF5 in general. And how do you get up to speed fast? Uh, stay tuned. We we have some info in this talk, and we've and we're up putting out some some information, including Jupyter notebooks and such, which have some uh, have some elegant ways to to get started using the product. Next thing you know about HDF five is the data model. There are uh, the uh, uh, the top quality objects in HDF five are groups, data sets, and attributes. Um, H, H and HDF5 stands for hierarchical. Uh, HDF5 is a file system within a file. And in HDF5 parlance, we, a decision was made to call directories groups. So a group is a directory, and it's as simple as that. It's how you structure hierarchically data in an HDF5 file. Data sets are, are the data. It's, uh, they're arrays of practically any type you can conceive of, including variable length types very, and, and nested types. You can have uh, variable length types of variable length types. There's a, a lot, of, um, lot of flexibility and, and, and such when creating, creating uh, types for your data sets. And the final uh, heavyweight object type or, or heavyweight uh, class in, in HDF5 is the attributes. Uh, attributes are basically a lightweight version of a data set. It's uh, something you can use to attach. Uh, it's a sticky note, if, if, if you will. It's like a sticky note that you attach to a book. Uh, book's got all the information, and this sticky note's just got some notes about it. It's some metadata. Um, and everything else is basically built from these parts in an HDF5 file. So again, you're... You can you have every every file will have a what's called a root group and it's just the slash it has use, uh, uses Unix file system uh, parlance and if you're if you're familiar with working with a Unix file system you'll have no trouble working with HDF5 groups uh, and you store you basically build a tree uh, if if you are at at whatever level of complexity is relevant to you and you build a tree within a file and you can actually mount other files on top you can actually mount other HDF5 files as file systems on top of a, of a given mount point within a HDF5 file. Uh, there's, again, lots of features, lots of flexibility, but you don't need to know about all that. All right, so some terminology. Data is our problem, our problem data. It's uh, most of, more often than not, it's a checkpoint that, you're, that you're, you're trying to checkpoint your work. You're running a large simulation on 30,000 processors on Blue Waters, and you don't want to have to repeat the last three hours of work or 10 hours because uh, something happened on the system 
or somebody did something for whatever reason, uh, you, you, you want to be able to checkpoint your work. And it's just a very, co very common solution for doing that. Uh, data is typically large arrays. You'll have, uh, maybe, maybe you're doing, um, let's see, uh, forward time simulation. And it just, it's a, it's a time step capture in uh, scalar field values or vector field values if you're doing fluid dynamics or some other, any, any other spatial dynamics okay, types of uh, computation. The term metadata is, it gets, it gets, is overloaded. It gets used for a lot of different things. So when we speak of metadata in this presentation, we're talking about HDF5 metadata. HDF5 metadata is, is telling is what is how HDF5 keeps track of where data sets are. It's it's all the information about the file in the file. So it's uh, it's not the information about it's not what your it's not what your data stands for. It's where it is in the file. If that makes any sense. So why why work with parallel HDF5? You're able to take advantage of high performance parallel I/O, but you're all, but you don't have to worry about getting too deep into it. You. Uh, once you've taken a hit to, work, to start working with HDF5, using the parallel using the parallel version just adds a few small uh, a few small things you need to do to, to take advantage of that. Uh, it's a well-defined layer that you're all if you, you you may already be using if you're using HDF5 uh, with a few MPI specific things that you need to do for it. Uh, you can. <laughs> It, it, it takes advantage of the parallel file system. Uh, it makes your makes your performance and your use of your application portable as well. Uh, I/O systems can vary by system, but HDF5 abstracts that live abstracts the underlying system from you enough that you can just worry about dealing with the HDF5 library for the most part. So, a few more details about what parallel HDF5 offers. It's uh, let's see. <clears throat> It'll, it allows you to do your reads and writes and, and, and operations on the HDF5 file in parallel using um, using MPI calls under the hood, and you can write to, write and write to a single file, or you could split into several files. Again, if you're writing 32,000 processes, have running a simulation, you and they're they're writing a terabyte of data each, you might not want to put that in a single file. Oh, you probably could on a, on Muster. Uh, but you might, be, but you, depending on how portable you want to be, you might want to split that up into other files using the split file driver. Uh, Parallel still supports that as well within HDF5. It uses a standard M parallel interface. It uses MPI I/O under the hood. Uh, so you, if you if you're familiar with that, then you don't have to. Then you're not necessarily worried about what HDF5 is doing. In, uh, it's using a standard paradigm there. Again, it's portable for different platforms. And files are files conform to the HDF5 file format. Um, so, for parallel HDF5, you get the standard HDF5 API and a few extra calls and such to take advantage of parallel. Um, why not just use parallel HDF5 all the time? It's just as user friendly as HDF5, and it has its HDF5 is implicit within parallel. It, it, part of it is it, it depends on having a working MPI installation. If you're running on your own system and you don't and you uh, you're running HDF5 in your own system at home, you don't, or, or on a virtual machine, or, or on your laptop, wherever you're working, you may not have an MPI installation, and so you would just use the serial version. But uh, it it's just a, it makes it adds a dependency for having to work in MPI installation. So, kind of in a in a picture, you you're working on an HDF5 application. You we're a, we're a library that we exist to you as a library with a set of calls. Uh, you're running on compute nodes. Compute nodes are making calls to the library, to the HDF5 library. HDF5 is talking to the MPI library under the hood, which is in turn talking to the the file on the parallel file system, and so on and so on down into the uh, networks, into the into the network of uh, I/O sub subsystems. The things that you don't things basically the further you get from the library, the deeper down, the less you actually have to worry about it. We uh, we bring everything up to the point where you just have to deal with the library for the most part. Some of those things can still come into play and we'll talk a bit about that and some specifics, but for the most part, that's that. Um, if, uh, if HDF5 is new to you, here's just a very quick rundown. When you're working with HDF5, you create or open a file, 
uh, and then within that file, you create or open a, or you create a data space, which is the shape of data you're going to write. It's the dimensions of your array. It's uh, maybe you want you can create fancy data spaces that uh, are uh, you know it's unions of different shapes and sizes or uh, of of, of uh, arrays. It's it comes down to being basically the shape and sh shape of your arrays. Uh, your data set you can create, or if you're or if you're working with an already created data set, you can create or opening a data set in an HDF5 file. Uh, you do things with the data set, and eventually you close the data set, you close the data space, and then you close the file. It's important to note that you have to close the objects when you're done with them. HDF5 is object oriented, but implemented in a non-object oriented language. Because it was started, the project was started many years ago, before well before C++ was even standardized or considered useful per se in high performance computing. It's it's done this way, um, uh, and it's just it's the same way you you need to remember to free. You make a malloc call. You need to remember to free your memory. You allocate objects in HDF5. You need to close them explicitly. It's the same same concept there because it consumes resources. What's different with an HDF5 or with a parallel program in HDF5? Uh, if you can see here what's what's highlighted in red, if you're like me and don't see colors extremely well, it's anything here that has MPI in the in the line in the signature calls. So uh, you're creating a a pro, uh, file access property list, and on that property list you're setting a property for uh, MPI I/O, and you tell it which communicator, and then you set some properties in an info object that tells it specifics about how to use MPI IO. But point being is that you just have a couple of additional calls that you need to make. Uh, and of course, you're running an MPI program, so you wrap it with an MPI init and an MPI finalize uh, on the, as your, as your inner and outer brackets on the, whole, on the whole code. Otherwise, it's just pretty much an HDF5 code. So a couple notes about etiquette when working with parallel HDF5. You're, you're opening a, a shared file with an MPI communicator. So you have 30,000 processes running. They're all opening, they're not opening 30,000 files. Uh, they're opening one file in parallel and they're with an MPI communicator. When you do this, you get a file handle uh, from the H, uh, H5F open command. You get a file handle. It's just a digital ID. It's, it's your way of accessing that file. You don't pass the file handle around between MPI processes. It's different on each machine, uh, cause, or it's different on each process. It's just, it's just that's what comes back from when, when you make the, H, the H5F open command, call. Uh, and so when you're accessing the file, you use this file handle. Uh, <clears throat> when you're making the collective calls, every, every process which is, using, which is using that file needs to make that call. So every pro, like if you're every process which is going to be using that file makes the call to H5F open, uh, and they make it, and they make it at the same time. Uh, if you have if if you're making them out of out of uh, every every process within the communicator has to be has to make the call, uh, and, and wait for it to return before before it moves on. Uh, you can you can open multiple files, but typically you'll do this using different communicators. If you have a certain set of processes you need to open one file, a different set of processes you need to open a different file, you'll use different communicators to do that. And note that all all the calls that are modifying structural metadata are collective. You can you can read files in uh, without making it a collective call, but uh, you let's see. But you if you're modifying the metadata. Then those those calls must be handled collectively. Now, your HDF5 file is uh, is a file to the to the underlying underlying parallel fire file system. It's nothing more than a long string of bytes uh, in in an, in an order. And when the parallel file system is cutting it up, they don't it doesn't care where your header data is, where your data set data is. It doesn't care what's in the file where. All it does is guarantee that it has it, it knows what uh, it knows where the pieces are and knows how to put them back together in the right order. So it slices it up into pieces and st stores them on the object storage targets on Luster. Uh, under the hood, it gets even more fun because these are rated systems. And I remember the first time seeing somebody um, 
20 years ago, pull up, just pull a drive out of a live RAID system and said, hey, check it out. This, it'll just rebuild itself and then pulled the, date, pulled the drive out. And I thought, well, that's, that's, pretty, in, that's pretty intense. It was, their, it was our department's data and they were just, uh, just doing that, but showing how that works under the hood. Point being, it's very reliable uh, what's going on under the hood here. There's many layers of abstraction on it, what's actually happening with the file systems. And even within HDF5, it gets a little bit more, a little, it gets worse before it gets better in terms of it being a little scary into how much the data gets cut up. If you're using contiguous storage, then you know that within your file, at least, your data set data is all stored adjacent. You have one data set and all, it's, it's a large array and it's just stored in a contiguous section of memory. Uh, you've got your metadata is stored in a separate place in the file, but it knows where to find that data set. Well, when you move to chunk storage, in which, which is typically what you'll be doing when you're writing in parallel, reading, reading and writing in parallel, is you have different processes operating on different chunks of data. Now within the HDF5 file, you've got a header which tells you where the chunk index is, and then that chunk index tells you where the chunks of data are stored within the HDF5 file. Oh, so it's yeah, yet another layer of, of uh, complexity, but again, you don't worry about this. The, the smarts are built into HDF5 to know how to handle this in an efficient way for the most part. We'll get into talking about what, what it involves to tune that uh, to get the best use of that, but this is what's happening under the hood. So all this is happening. It's being sliced up many ways, being written to the storage targets. Uh, this is the ugly. This is, you, you don't need to worry too much about this. this uh, until we talk about you, you the, the number one thing you'll take away from this is that chunk size is important because typically because it's the one thing you have control over being contiguous and remember being able to read contiguously is faster than being able to read uh, randomly different plates, plates places in memory or places in a file. That's almost all. That's I want to say it's always true. I'd say it's certainly almost always true. Probably always true. There's always an exception. So running collective versus independent I.O. Uh, for, for collective calls, it means all the, all the processes in the communicator are participating in that call in the right order. Uh, everybody calls process A, then everybody calls process B. You can't have everybody call process B and then call process A uh, because it won't work. It'll, it'll probably just end up hanging on you. Uh, now collective is, I mean, or there's, so that's collective. If it's not collective, you're making an independent call. It just means you're not doing it collectively. Uh, you're attempting to, uh, and, and, you, and this is fine for reads. You can be reading, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> reading at different places. Um, and it's not interfering because it's just a read. That doesn't necessarily imply synchronous. It just, reply, it, it just says that things are happening in a certain order. Uh, Depending on, and neither, neither mode is preferable a priori. It, it depends what you're trying to do. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit on that. So now the idea with, with collective IO, the, the big takeaway here is if you're doing an independent write, if you're writing one byte, is that's worst case scenario. You're writing single, a single byte per processor to a file. That's gonna, and you have 30,000 processes, you know, that's, that's 30,000 bytes. That's not a lot of data, and that's a whole lot of processes trying to write one byte to a file. You, you certainly wanna do some collective I.O. there. What collective I.O. does is it bundles those writes into, into larger blocks um, and, and just only, and, and figures out a smarter way to do those writes using, using MPI I.O. under the hood. So typically, data, is, is data vary, the size of data varies with the size of your problem, whereas with metadata, it's, metadata tends to be very small. Uh, with, with your reading and writing data, it can be in, independent or collective. When you're writing and dealing with metadata, same thing, reads can be independent or collective, uh, particularly in, in uh, the HD5 110 and newer versions, it allows for collective metadata operations. The, these were uh, <clears throat> the, these were handled differently in previous versions and were and were a performance issue for large scale for larger scale applications. We'll talk about that when we get into read storms. So things that can be improved, uh, particularly avoiding unnecessary I/O, um, checking your I/O frequency. If you're writing 
if you're writing a checkpoint file, if, you, if your simulation runs for five minutes before the next time to, to generate the next time step, and it takes you 20 minutes to write a checkpoint file, then you're probably writing too many. You're probably writing your checkpoint file too often. Uh, probably doing bio frequency too much. But that that depends on your application. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another thing you can we, we'll talk is just tuning tuning chunk size, how, how your IOs lay out in terms of chunks. Uh, for metadata, <clears throat> use the late, use, if you're using the latest library version, then you get the enhancements to the metadata. So it's in in working on this project, this was actually the thing that made us jump from working with version 1.8 to to version 1.10 of HDF5. Was the was for the we were hitting read storms, and so we went with the newest version uh, in order to avoid the reads the read storms and and I'll, I'll, I've, I've said read storm like five times if I, uh, a read storm is basically when everybody 30,000 processes are all trying to access the same piece of metadata they 30,000 processes are each going to be working on a different part of the HDF5 file they're going to be working on a chunk in a different part of the file but they all need to be able to read the index which means if you're not doing your operation collectively then you're, that means you have 30,000 processes waiting in line to read the same piece of information. If you do it collectively, then process zero reads the metadata and it distributes that information to the rest of the processes. And, uh, and that's inherently a much more efficient uh, and faster process. So just a reminder, it's a, it's a multi-layer platform Application is built on top of HDF5. The application may also be doing some direct calls to MPI IO. Uh, you can't ignore the Lester file system entirely. Uh, but I've I've seen a quote from uh, Mohammed, who was one of our, uh, who's a former former team member of ours, uh, saying that just that uh, most of the IO problems that come across are surprisingly because people are not setting a high enough stripe count or a, or a, usually usually it's the stripe count. Uh, sometimes it's the stripe size for the Lustre file system. If you're running 30,000 processes, two stripes is probably not enough. It's hard to say what's optimal, and there are some guidelines that are published from NERSC about what are more optimal settings. And there are some automatic ways of, of a, they have um, they have a protocol for setting stripe size automatically uh, with an with a with an option. Oh, but it's it's worth it's worth being aware of stripe size and stripe count on the parallel file system, uh, and and you don't worry about the storage hardware. You that's far enough away from what you ever have to touch, and you just assume everything is running well there because it usually is. Okay, so methodology, and I would I would like to say that this is this is how we approached uh, this particular problem, and that we did everything. Um, in a very smart procedural way. The truth is, research is messy. Uh, anything is messy. We tried things. Uh, we've we we made mistakes. We got some readings. We did we did a lot of these things out of order. And this is kind of a takeaway. Like this is this is more of a best practices. This is how we wish we had done it, or this is how we would recommend approaching a a project like this in the future. So, again, it's always messy. And so this is this is what our takeaways were. Is it? Um, First off, remember that I/O is a first-tier design consideration. It's it's just as important to to think to think in terms of optimal I/O as it is in terms of using your cycles efficiently. Because really, cycles are cheap. Cycles are dirt cheap now. It's really getting the data to the processors. <clears throat> like if you're if you're using 10% of your cycles, you're doing a pretty good job. If you can get uh, if you can get more data to the processors, however that has to be, or get more data away from the processors when when that has to happen for storing data, et cetera, then you're then you're doing well. Uh, our next recommendation is, is get a baseline reading. What's our current performance? You know, if you want, if you're looking to improve your performance, you have to know where you are, and have to, and you have to be able to measure that. So set up a protocol for measuring your performance. Uh, Darshan is a tool that's that's quite useful for that. It gives you some detailed explanations for all the MPI calls that are being made uh, gives you a large, lot of profiling information, and it's it's very it's very lightweight and very cheap and easy to do. Uh, particularly on Blue Waters, Darshan is just it simply intercepts all of your MPI calls and does logging does logging of what's going on, and then and then passes on the call. Uh, doesn't on, only negligible if, if if even measurable slowdown to the process. 
Uh, next thing we talk talk is to is say talk to an expert. There's uh, HDF5 is a complicated tool with a lot of with a lot of things happening that are not always obvious to, to a non-expert. We we struggle with we struggle with a lot of the features ourselves. This is a product. It's been a library. It's been in development for 30 years. Uh, we ask each other questions all the time. So talk to an expert, and chances are we might not know the answer, but we might we can probably find somebody who does. So come come talk to us, and we can help you. When you get stuck, talk to us, and we can figure out how to get the performance you're looking for. Uh, next thing, look for low-hanging fruit. Uh, in, in the example that we'll present, chunk size was, uh, for, our, for our customer, chunk size was something that was uh, became was, was immediately obvious. It was like, okay, yeah, we'll just we'll adjust the chunk size. We should, we'll probably get much better performance just by because they were using very small chunks. Again, small, uh, lots of small writes uh, doesn't doesn't perform well on a parallel file system. Doesn't really write doesn't necessarily perform well anywhere. Uh, so that was that was low hanging fruit in that case. The other thing is we, we decided it, this is a good recommendation is to an extract an I/O kernel. You're interested, if you're interested in the process of writing a checkpoint or, or whatever I.O. that you're going to be doing for a given program, you don't need to run the whole program. Again, if it's, if it's 20 minutes, if it's five minutes to generate a check or to generate data for a checkpoint, but it takes 30 seconds to write the checkpoint, you don't want to do that five minute process over and over and over again when all you're interested in is the writing the checkpoint process. So what we did was extract a kernel which does the same operation as the I.O. For the, for the application, but that's all it does. It doesn't do any of the other application stuff. The next, next point is uh, prepare to be surprised. All complex systems are inherently unpredictable. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have had things like the flash crash. I mean, there's, uh, you can try some things out and then suddenly you'll just discover something may, may, something may make performance terrible or something may just make things run a whole lot more efficient or just make you wonder or make you think about things a different way. Complex systems will, will reveal things uh, in nonlinear fashions. Like they'll just sometimes, something will just emerge sometimes, which is like really surprising. So prepare for that to happen. Uh, black swans are, are, are omnipresent in, in complex systems. Uh, next, next point is, is avoid unnecessary IO, IO. And I spoke to that a bit already. Right, don't do I/O when you don't need to do I/O. Like uh, if you're right, just measure measure the time to run the simulation between uh, between checkpoints, and measure the time it takes to run a checkpoint, and use that information to determine how often you need to write it. Next, uh, next topic is, is talk about preparing a baseline. We want to know where we're starting from, so uh, we. We can you can use you can use use the if you have your your original application you can instrument your application, uh, or it might be easiest just to move ahead to the I/O kernel in order to extract your to, to extract your baseline case. Uh, you can also do some back of the envelope calculations, like you you know get a, get a feel for for what for what the problem is. Think about the problem a little bit, define it a little bit better. Uh, come up with some benchmarks for like, okay, this is this is what we feel like our problem is, our, our I/O issue is. Get develop benchmarks like say this is how we're going to measure it moving forward. This is what we need to measure. Uh, have have your application run with representative workloads. Uh, we originally wrote this uh, I/O kernel for uh, for this project using um, let's see using um, uh, just junk using just junk data, uh, not necessarily representative of, um, of of the data that might be coming out of the simulation. It was the same type, um, but we, we also wanted to we, we in the we went on we moved on to actually go and look at some uh, parallel compression, which is a, an emerging feature in HDF in HDF5. Uh, for compressing the data on the fly, and we wanted to make sure we were looking at that with representative data, and not just looking at that with um, uh, arbitrary junk data. So that was one of the things that we had done later on in the project. So uh, decide on what your metrics are. This, is, this goes along with like, okay, benchmarks is like, okay, what what are we going to measure, and then how and how are we going to measure it? So I/O size in megabytes read and written, uh, I/O rates. You know, figure out the total total I/O, uh, how fast how fast it's moving, and figure out how much time your application is being spent in I/O, 
And you can also look at distribution of read and write sizes. Like, okay, well, do we have a lot of small reads and writes, or is every, or what proportion of them are, are large reads and writes? Know what the, know what your program is doing so that you can so, so you know how to optimize it. Like, if if you're if you're trying to optimize to get rid of a bunch of small writes and you don't actually have any, then you're you're working on the wrong problem. So, getting a baseline reading. Uh, this is this is uh, data that our, our uh, that our team or our, let's see that our uh, our client team had come to us with. They were, the, and they were using a very small chunk size on this. This was their initial reading with uh, parallel HDF5 versus a couple of other um, I/O paradigms. And this is just even even on a very small number of cores, they were already seeing um, egregious run times for writing I/O with uh, with, a, with parallel HDF5. They're also using a, an embarrassingly small chunk size, and, all, and, and uh, you may recognize five as being a prime number, uh, which doesn't, doesn't factor well, doesn't align well per se. So, so this, this is a chunk size of 325, or sorry, 625 by, or uh, 625 times four because they were writing floats. That's, their, that's the size of a chunk in, in data. Uh, so first thing we did was look for low hanging fruit. Let's try, a chunk size that's larger and has a and has a more ple more pleasing alignment, or more likely to have a pleasing alignment. So we tried this with uh, so we're moving from 625 um, elements to uh, 4,000 wait 40, 4096 uh, elements, and immediately we saw quite a quite a bit of improvement. Uh, it turns out the chunk size was a very important issue, and we and we got this. Uh, this was the first. This was again just the first pass at trying to make an improvement, and this was on their code before we got into developing a kernel uh, for it. So, low-hanging fruit. So, extracting a kernel. In this particular case, it was it's a uh, it's scalar field data. It's uh, three-dimensional data being saved out to a, a checkpoint file uh, as the, as the simulation runs. Every time step would as a time step would run, it would save the state of the data. Or save the state of the simulation. Run for another time step. Save the save the state of it at that time step. Uh, moving forward, and we developed a kernel based based on that. Uh, so it's writing mock floating point data in parallel to a mock uh, checkpoint file. Again, it's not it's not actually running the simulation. It just it's just doing the I/O operation. It's writing in this case single precision floats. Uh, of a given shape and size and 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 such, uh, which is configurable, and it's writing this out to a checkpoint to a mock checkpoint file, and it's measuring how fast that happens. Oh, we made the kernel to, to be configurable for different extents of physical domain, like how how large is our of a, of a physical system is it representing? Uh, these this in, in individual elements of the physical domain would be mapped to processors, and that was how we were considering uh, mapping those extents. Uh, we made it configurable for the chunk shape and size as well. You could have uh, long, thin chunks. We could have um, really flat pancake-style chunks, um, and, and et cetera, et cetera. That was all configurable options. More options than you really want to play with when you're optimizing, but we put all those in there because uh, we wanted to make this this kernel, we, we believe that this kernel would be usable uh, beyond just for this project, and so we made all these things configurable. Oh, <clears throat> there's a processor to physical domain mapping. Basically, we're saying extensive physical domain by mapping it to processors accordingly. I'll, and I'll, I'll show this in a moment. I have a picture which illustrates this better, but I'm, I'll just mention what's going into it at this point. Uh, you have an optional use for, you, for whether or not to use collective metadata, uh, again, which becomes very important when you have when the, when the system scales. Uh, let's see, and using for uh, collective rights, underlying, underlying, utilizing underlying MPI I/O, and then there was another option we discovered. This is one where. Uh, we're the experts, sort of, but we, we within our group we have to talk to each other, and, and there's other people who know different things. This is something we discovered talking to one of our colleagues that ended up being a very useful optimization was uh, uh, having to do with whether whether or not there's a fill a fill value set when you're creating a new data set. And we also added an option for uh, using multiple parallel compression filters. This is a this is a, a new feature of HDF5. 
Oh, we have this installed as a trial version. A trial version of this uh, of this parallel compression is installed on Blue Waters and is available. We'll talk about this toward the end of the talk. Um, it's not available in general in general release until version 1.10.2, uh, which hopefully will be out later this this summer or later this year. Oh, but it's an it's a configurable option for our kernel that we included. So the uh, image here is basically uh, representing, or is how our data is being, being represented. It's three-dimensional data for a given time step. Uh, the large blocks here uh, represent the, <clears throat> the number of processors in each, in each given direction. We, we're providing an XYZ number of processors in each direction. That's what the large white blocks represent. In this case, these blocks uh, are, uh, we have a five by four by two uh, layout of those blocks. So we specify five by four by two for processors. Uh, within, actually, actually I'll move on to the next slide, which tells where, uh, this is a, on the left is a sample input script to the Sysum Core I.O. kernel. So we're specifying five, four, two, four, how, the, how these large blocks are, are mapped out to processors. Chunk sizes, in this case, the colored blocks are representing chunks in the HDF5 space of it. These do not necessarily have to map uh, uh, to the, how the processes are laid out. They, they work better, they'll typically work better if they do, but we made it flexible so that they don't necessarily have to be mapped that way. Uh, we see these blocks are six by two by three. And then finally, the, for domain, we, we said that each processor has one of the large white blocks. The dimensions of the white, large white blocks are the domain, that's four by four by four. Uh, and that's how, that's how that's mapped out. So it tells you the, whole, the entirety of the system size, uh, how the blocks, uh, let's see, how, the, how, the, how things are chunked up in that system, and what, how the blocks are mapped to different MPI processes in that system. Uh, next things we have in this are, we have how many time steps to run for. We run this for five, to, to simulate this, we run this for five time steps. Uh, it generates one data set, or, I, or it generates one slice in the data set for each of the five time steps. Uh, we specify pre-create is an option where we can create, we can specify that we want uh, instead of creating this file and creating all the and creating the data set in the file using all 32,000 processes, it's a we have the option to do it with just a single process. You're not writing any data; you're just creating the data. You're, you're creating the file and the data set. So we do that with a single process because it's typically more efficient to do so that way. Uh, you can do it, but you could also do it collectively. So we leave that as an option. Uh, we leave an option for collective rights, <clears throat> whether whether we're doing whether we're for for in the case where we have small small amounts of small chunk sizes, et cetera, we have an option of, of specifying collective right, where will it will it write will it aggregate these chunks faster um, using the internal workings of HDF five to to aggregate those rights. Uh, we allow, allow that as an option. Next option is whether to use collective metadata. Uh, the read storm problem, if we set collective metadata, then we're reading the metadata collectively, and, and, if, and for large scales, for a large simulation, we, have, we, we see less overhead in terms of uh, reading the metadata, learning where the chunk sizes are, HDF5 learning where the chunks are in the file. Uh, this never fill option, these, these, and these are binary options. These are either in the file or they're not in the, in the file. If they're specified, then these things are done. Never fill tells, uh, tells HDF5 to, uh, to not provide a fill value for, uh, for data when it's being allocated. Uh, and this ended up actually being a very large performance improvement because the default is to is to fill the blocks with some with something, uh, either either you're zeroing it out or you're writing writing something to it. Uh, th this ends up being overkill because typically the file system will do will take care of this under the hood, and will deliver it. It, it, will, it will either deliver a clean. It, it, uh, you, you don't want to be reading a new. You don't want to try to read from something that hasn't hasn't had something meaningful written to it. The file system is going to deliver you something either that's either clean or that's uh, somehow been scrubbed enough that you're not able to see whatever data was on it before. Uh, HDF5 does the same, will by default does the same thing unless you specify never fill. 
It's just saying, don't bother. We're just going to trust that the file that the file system is giving us clean enough, and we're not going to we're we're smart enough to not try to read from whatever junk the file system might give us, which is probably not even junk anyway. Uh, and then the last line of of the script, which uh, is just to say done. So what I've in running these scripts, I typically put these in a here doc and submit them in a batch file where it's reading this. Uh, and then if you want to do another one of these, you just you just include this in a in a batch in a batch script. Defining the search space, we talked about all all these many parameters we can tune, and that's that's too many parameters. It's too many things to look at. So we want to we want to try to narrow that down a bit. Like we make some decisions about what we think will be important um, in, in doing the optimization. Um, sometimes you're looking for particular lines or loops when you're doing an optimization. This we don't get into that as much with this project. That's that's more in the application code. But if you're if you're digging into your application code, uh, you might look and see where where things are getting stuck. Uh, it's better to look at, at, at to decide on a few variables which are uh, reasonably reasonably important, and it's important not to change more than one variable at a time. I'll, this is this is just uh, the scientific method. You you set you control for everything, but then you have your uh, and I'm I'm blanking on the term for it. But you have your your, your control for all the variables but one, and that's your experimental variable. Uh, and then you're able to adjust based on how much of the parameter space of of potential things you could explore. It depends on how much can how much time you have, uh, how much control you have over things, and your budget. And I'll just present a, a couple example results to here. Uh, this is scaling only up to a thousand cores, just uh, just to get a general idea of some things. Uh, things that we found that worked: uh, collective write, like, and this is um, write throughput is what, uh, shown on the left axis. It's write throughput in megabytes per second. Uh, collective write. Or, or start, I'm sorry. Let me start with the default case. The default case is the double line here, uh, which showed that. And, and let me emphasize, this is for single stripe performance. We were trying to optimize only for a single stripe before we were moving on from that. Uh, and we see it basically peaks out just without doing any optimizations. It peaks out around 900 or so megabytes per second. Uh, we tried using collective write, and we saw, surprisingly, so again, be prepared to be surprised, uh, we saw this uh, giving better performance overall for small small numbers of cores, and then um, blanking out for larger numbers of cores. Uh, we believe this is this is we believe this would probably be only a, only um, it would probably only look like this on a single stripe. But again, this wasn't something we looked decided to look into deeply. Uh, let's see, and the next next thing we looked at just was uh, looking at collective metadata. Uh, Generally, we generally saw a uh, let's see uh, monotonically increasing, except for one data point here. So there could be system noise. It maybe maybe there was a system hush. It, some some random thing could have happened. We don't know. Uh, but we but we just saw the general trend that uh, using collective metadata seemed to be helping us uh, go fast, get 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 better throughput. I mentioned this never fill characteristic. Uh, this is. Showing file creation time versus number of cores opening and closing the or, uh, being used to uh, run the overall simulation. Uh, what we what we discovered is that setting not setting this fill value, the file creation it it's worth mention it, it it bears mentioning that in creating the file in parallel, you have to do you have to set an early allocation. It's it's required by the library to alloc actually allocate the space in the file. If you're running, if you're doing chunk data in serial, it, then space for the space for the chunks of data are allocated as needed. Uh, because we were doing this in parallel, it's, re, it's it's the way it's written is that it's required that those chunks be allocated when the file is created. So, uh, allocating those allocating all those chunks. If you're writing a fill value, that means you actually have to take the time to write something to whatever the file system is giving you, as opposed to just taking what the file system is giving you. Um, Verbatim, uh, by just taking what the file system is give it, gives us, we re reduce the uh, reduce the overall time for allocating space in the file to a matter of a, of a handful of seconds, as opposed to linear scaling with the system size. So that was uh, that was a proved to be a, a surprising and, and very important enhancement. And we did this in uh, 
actually our, our, uh, our customer did this, used, uh, put, ended up taking this enhancement, putting it back into their application and then running these, uh, running these numbers. They had, instrumented, they had instrumented their actual simulation code, or their application code to, to, get, to get these readings. Uh, what they saw was basically absolutely in line with what we were seeing with, with the kernel. Uh, original time to writes. Write times were, sca were, were, were scaling, were, were pretty much flat. Uh, there was a slight increase in the amount of time to write the same amount, or to get the same, let's see. There's, there's a lot of information in this graph and I'm trying to figure out how to, to, to get the best points. Uh, they were seeing basically flat scaling because you're writing this, the same amount of, pro of data per core. So you expect to see flat scaling there. Uh, the original open times for the file in which the, which the space is being allocated to write that data uh, were growing exponentially. But the, uh, using, this never fill, uh, as a, using this never fill option, those times basically uh, dropped to zero in terms of time to allocate. And so all the time that was spent was, uh, for that was, being, was basically time that was needed to write the data itself. Which is what we want. We want this time to be spent to write the data and to be writing the data efficiently as possible. Optimization uh, can be can be pathological. It can it can it can be your white whale if you want it to be. Uh, reference to Moby Dick. It can be the thing you keep chasing, but you you should know when to stop. Um, you can get as much as you want, but you can't get it all. Is a some, is a phrase that comes to mind. Uh, when you've reached your goal, you, you know, maybe, you never, maybe you never got the performance you, you quite wanted, but maybe you got close enough. Uh, you, you maybe, maybe you run out of money or time, or your boss just says, hey, you really need to move on and get started on this next project, wrap it up, and we'll go from there. Is uh, another thing that can happen. Diminishing returns is what usually happens, and, uh, and may, or maybe you find a new problem in a different part of the application. There's always, there's always something else to work on. Uh, so find a place to stop. Oh, I'm a chemical engineer and a thermodynamicist, and I like to speak of uh, I like I like to throw this up to say that performance is uh, let's see that the change in performance, the overall optimization of performance is not an exact differential. It's just a, it's a it's it's a way of saying that not uh, surprising things can happen. You can you can change one variable at a time. And the ways that things, it, it's not a simple sum of what improvements you get by changing one variable and then changing another variable. It's not a simple sum. These things can interact in surprising ways and still, but, but still the best, thing, the best thing we were able to do is to optimize for one variable at a time. And, we, and if we discover something drastically different, we may have to re-optimize in, in a new neighborhood of everything else for that one variable. <clears throat> uh, and to close about that project, oh, just to mention this, is that uh, we were ultimately, th this is, uh, let's see, this is, ap this is actually back, back, back to the application using the different I.O. paradigms. We were able to get the uh, parallel HDF, HDF5 performance to be as, as good or, in, or in, in many cases better, it's shown in the, yellow, the bar on the furthest left here, uh, it, at least as good as, Definitely in the same order of magnitude, and, and occasionally slightly better performance than uh, than than some of the other I/O paradigms um, for that application. So they were able to they were able to keep HDF5 as a viable format and and get and get excellent performance with it. So let's see. So I have a couple additional topics. Just Scott, could I get an idea how much time we or what were we at for time? Okay. Okay. So the top of the hour. Okay. All right, so uh, I mentioned parallel compression a couple of times. This is a, a feature that's coming coming out and available, or soon, hopefully to be available soon. But it's available as a feature deployment on Blue Waters. <clears throat> you may or may not get a better write, overall write performance. Uh, probably with larger scale systems, uh, with many with much more cores, you, uh, because of coordination efforts, ultimately you you might actually get better throughput. Uh, but the compression itself takes some time. What you most likely, almost definitely will get is a smaller data file, which is a good thing to have. So in this, in this case, we saw a factor of a thousand, just, this was extremely compressible data. Uh, it was just basically writing the MPI rank as a float value into, into a data set. Um, that's the default operation. And we saw a thousand fold improvement. Uh, I wanna mention a plugin that we've written for this, this, uh, this ISM core. IO kernel, 
which allows you to use any function you want. Um, it's implemented in the form of a dynamically loadable shared library. Uh, all you have to do, and it can be any functional form you want. You can use it to read and write in, junk, write in your own uh, typical data set and test how fast the IO kernel writes, reads and writes your, tip, uh, your typical data set. Uh, you can use some function. For, I, have a, I have three standard examples in there. One writes MPI rank, one writes a, 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 a spherical Gaussian function, and the third actually writes uh, uh, our, our users, a slice of our users' data, writes that data in and out of the, in, into the checkpoint file. Um, it's easy enough to implement. All you have to do is write a function, compile it, and put it into a shared library. Put that library into the load, into the LD library path, and then you can pass parameters to that function through your input script. And I have a very simple example here. This is a complete plugin right here. It's called MPI Rank Fill. Oh, let me get back to. The, Okay, you have what's what's being passed into it is this is the rank of the process that you're that's being simulated, or this is the rank that the, the MPI rank for the process that's being run. Uh, it's this is your system size. Uh, it's a three-dimensional quantity. It's it's like no, this is how big your system is. This is how big the blocks are. This is which block you're in, and this is your position in that block. And then you pass in. Okay, here's here's whatever parameters you want to pass to your function. You got argc and argv, just like a standard with a standard C function. This particular function ignores everything except the MPI rank, and it just writes floats uh, equal to the MPI rank into the into your, uh, for, your, for, your fill, for your fill data, for your junk data. To deploy it, all you have to do is include these two lines in the, in the script uh, for testing. You tell it, uh, use this, li use this uh, libplugins.so, that's, that's where I stuck the function, and here's the name of the function, and then everything else is taken care of. Uh, <clears throat> a little more complicated one, if you actually do want to pass parameters into the function, here's one which, Here's a, it's, it's in this, I threw it into the same plugin library, libplugins.so. I called it SD for, it's a group from San Diego, and we're writing basically a, a slice of their data. Uh, this plugin takes one argument, it's where is that slice of data? This is just a binary file, this is just the, where, where this binary file is that contains the data. Oh. <clears throat> and, we, and then using this data, so I mentioned compression can, results can vary with compression. We got a factor of 10 uh, for compressibility with a typical slice of their data. So, so they have, so they, if, if using this uh, inline compression, they can actually get a checkpoint file that's possibly 10, an order of magnitude smaller. Uh, the write time for it was actually slower by, uh, by a factor of about two. But that's one of those things you take into account when you're optimizing for, for how, you know, what's, what's more important? What do you, where do you get the most bang for your buck? And let's see. Uh, and then these are, this is using just a gzip deflate filter level five. Uh, that's, you can use other deflate filters with this. Um, so you can use, you, you can use other, any of the supported filters for HDF5 can be used with this. Um, and then different compression levels can be set. And I think the last thing I should mention is just we've got a few experimental modules that are basically feature versions of HDF5 that we have deployed to Blue Waters. Uh, if you want to play with these, parallel compression exists in uh, 1.9.236 version of HDF5. Uh, <clears throat> all you have to do is uh, first you say module and to, to use these modules. You say module use. This is where the modules live, and then you just say module load phdf5 and then slash 1.9.236 and boom, your library is available for you to use on Blue Waters. Uh, we plan to continue to do this for deployment for our own testing, and, and as always, we welcome feedback uh, on how these, how these functions are working. Again, this, it's pre-release, and so we, want, we like to fix things before they get out into the release, and if you're just excited to test them in anticipation of that, we, we have that available to you. Uh, we also have compression libraries like SZIP and ZFP compression, uh, and then the connector for that for HDF5, um, and and this this is a this is a new undertaking, and we hope hope that these will be will continue to add some functions here, in the future, and I I think I'm, and I, I mentioned metadata read storms, uh, yeah, and I'll just I'll just close it with saying thanks and and take any questions if there's uh, from from anyone online if I can clarify anything or just questions about HDF5 group. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, 
If you do have any questions, uh, go ahead and post them on the Slack channel. Uh, we do want to thank your colleague, Gerd, for helping to answer a lot of questions that have been posed through the Slack channel. Uh, there have been good interaction, good discussion going on in the background. So thank you, Gerd, for your help and support there as well. Um, I think the one question that jumped out for me uh, from the, the Slack channel discussion, someone asked about uh, size M and whether it's part of HDF5 or not. Uh, Gerd replied it's part of the I.O. kernel, but do you want to elaborate a bit? Yeah, sure. The, so the uh, size M core is a, it's part of a, it's an I.O. kernel that was, which was developed um, for work with the project under Blue Waters. And it's, um, I don't know. I don't know whether it's going to end up in the distribution yet. It, it's still basically some. It's still basically under development, and I believe. But oh, let me say to contact us. I I, I should be putting up our. Yeah, flip back. Please. Let's see. I apologize. I, oh, all right. Oh, I don't have my email address up here. All right, here it is. Okay, here's here's our contact info. Uh, if you're interested in playing with the kernel, get it, get in touch with us. We can make sure that you're able to get a version of it to experiment with. Uh, it's not currently distributed with HDF5, but it may be in the future. We're we're developing some performance frame from performance testing framework, and it's uh, going to be looks like it's going to be a part of that. So, uh, get basically short answer. Get in touch, and we can we can get we can hook you up with a version of that if you're interested. So the other item we discussed prior to the start is there will be a new release coming out and we'll uh, work with the HDF group to schedule a webinar once that new version of HDF is available so we can share that with the community. Fair enough? Yeah, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're looking to do another seminar like this, uh, particularly like revolving around uh, releases of, 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 of new features and such. So. Uh, look, look forward to hearing more from us in the future, especially in, and let us know if uh, if this is helpful or if you're um, or if you want to see something different in terms of content in something like this. Let us know. Um, we're, we're happy to get the information out, and we're happy to uh, be in town with Blue, with uh, with Scott and the, the team at NCSA. Um, it, it, it helps us. It helps both our teams to to put things like this together and get information out. So. Thanks for the opportunity. Like, looks like one more question. Any suggestions for tools to measure I/O performance? Uh, if, if, if nothing else, uh, Darshan is a good is a good place to start. And for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, gosh, <laughs> um, I I don't know a lot of I, I I don't know what else to recommend out of the box. Uh, it, it takes some time. I I'd say. Play around with some things. Inst try instrumenting your code. Just reading and writing, reading in raw times. Uh, yeah, if if nothing else, just try instrumenting your code. is a good place to start. That's probably the easiest thing to start with. Just writing out sometimes from within your own code. All right. Uh, just one more question here. Yeah, I was confused. When you were saying to only um, only modify one variable at a time when you're trying to optimize performance. It seems like very limiting, especially. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. The, the bottom line is that is you you have a very high dimensional space to explore, and you're not going to be able to get to all of it. Um, you try to make some educated guesses about things you think might be helpful, and then when you find one, you try to find the sweet spot with one particular optimization, and then move on to optimizing a different variable. There's there's not a good way to do all of them. That's all. I mean, I think about like the whole world of like. And CNC and other similar algorithms, optimization algorithms, they explore the entire space at once without kind of stopping and looking within one parameter at a time. Right? It, yeah, there's. I'm. Uh, I'm. I, th I think there's like whole fields of study dedicated to optimization, and I. I. I really. Very, I know very little. I just. Yeah. I'm just looking at it from practical aspect of what what was useful to us, but yeah, I'm sure there's. I. I I think it's probably an interesting topic, and you could go probably very deep with that. All right, with that, uh, please join me in thanking Frank for the, the very insightful uh, presentation.
want to let you all know that our next webinar next week uh, will be uh, a return visit by Vichia Bird from Purdue to talk about introduction to scientific visualization using Paraview. And then the next uh, workflow webinar will be April 12th by Elizabeth Leakes, uh, uh, Wicks talking about computational data workflow mapping. Uh, you'll shortly receive an email letting you know when this uh, webinar is available for uh, viewing on uh, YouTube. And we'll be sending you a short survey to get your feedback and suggestions for how we can improve the webinar series. With that, thank you all, and hopefully we'll see you again uh, in a future Wednesday webinar. Bye-bye.